three, three forms of resistance. There's a world of flesh and the devil. And so this whole world culture that we live in, it's like completely against the direction that we're trying to live. It's the undercurrent. You know, if you ever walk out to the Gulf, you go out too far and the undertow catches you. Like it's totally trying to move you in an opposite direction. Not only that, but our flesh, what you had to overcome this morning to get here, pulls us in a different direction. And then we have this enemy, this roaring lion who's seeking to devour us. There is all kind of resistance. And the way you cut through this thing is that you keep your axe sharp. And so this is what we're trying to do here. Okay, so in the material, uh, we, we kind of have this working definition for spiritual disciplines, all right? So this is by way of review. This is what are spiritual disciplines? Uh, Russ says, intentionally directed actions. I think in your notes this morning, it's at the bottom of the page. Uh, where do I start at the bottom? I start, start with dessert first. <laughs> Yeah. Okay, intentionally directed actions that develop our understanding and expression of our relationship with God. Okay, so there's some, some intentional things that we're going to do. And these uh, habits, <laughs> these, these intentional acts, are really designed to uh, develop our understanding of God and our expression of God, so uh, uh, of uh, this relationship. So that's really what we're trying to do. Uh, here, here's another way to think about things. The, uh, the spiritual disciplines, they are like uh, jumper cables, if you will. Uh, when your, your battery gets cold and it, it's old, and it, it's, it starts dying and, and it refuses to crank. And uh, you can't, you can't uh, stretch this metaphor too far. <laughs> it only works a, uh, to, to a degree, but basically you've got to connect to the life of a strong, strong battery. And if you've ever been in a situation where you needed to jump and someone's available to do the jump, but you can't find anyone with jumper cables. And, and what connects us, who basically have a tendency to just shrivel up and die spiritually, and I don't mean die in the sense that you lose your salvation, you know, but just in terms of your spiritual um, uh, uh, stamina, just the dynamic of being spiritually alive and healthy, that... Uh, when, when that begins to shrink, because it's always, we're always being drained. I mean, to lead well, to be men in this situation, you're just being drained all the time. And right when you, at the end of the day, when you wish that you could, you know, kind of recharge and you come home and your wife's got a lot of needs and kids got a lot of needs, you just man, you're <coughs> drained and drained, drained. Well, it's the, it's the spiritual disciplines of the jumper cables. Now, I don't know if those things help you, but that, that so helps me. Because, like, I can neglect the jumper cables, and I'm not going to really connect well to the life of God who really wants to recharge me. And so the time, then, that you spend, whether prayer, a quiet time, meditation that we're talking about this morning, all these different things, like, they, they are the ways that keep us connected to the life of God. Um, another way is to think about, um, uh, I, I love this analogy that John Ortberg develops, where he uh, it's either Orberg or Heibels. You know, those guys work with each other for a while. But um, he basically says that when we long to move forward spiritually, that what really carries us forward is obviously the Holy Spirit. That's why the Bible talks about yield to the Spirit. Uh, those who are led by the Spirit are sons of God. In other words, it's the Spirit of God that really comes up under us and moves us forward. And what uh, these guys say, and Hybels is a big guy uh, in terms of sailing, is his big hobby. He basically says that the spiritual disciplines, or what we're calling this year the holy habits, are basically the things that we do to raise the sails that catch the wind of the Spirit. And you can desire to move forward with God, but without raising the sails, you're not going to catch the wind of the Spirit. And so all of this is illustrative of the fact that spiritual disciplines are a means to an end. Sometimes we get hung up on the fact that, oh no, my, my Christian life is all about how faithful I am in reading the Bible. And that's confusing means and end. The Christian life is basically allowing God's Spirit to move you forward in the Spirit of Jesus Christ living and loving and leading through you. And what keeps us connected, the jumper cables, 
spiritual disciplines. What helps us raise the cells to catch the wind of the spirit? Spiritual disciplines, these things that we're talking about. And so I just want to tell you that it's no small thing that you're in here this morning, that you're doing this course. It's really, really going to help us. And, and uh, especially this idea of men understanding each other, like what's unique about being a man and trying to live a godly life in a very ungodly world. And the role of disciplines and the role of just cheering each other on and all this. So uh, th those are huge things. So today we're basically going to talk about the uh, spiritual discipline of meditation. And so, uh, again, let me get you thinking this, this morning. Like, what immediately comes to your mind when you hear the idea of meditation? Some guru in India. <laughs> How many of you think that? I mean, don't you kind of think that? Like, if you're old enough, you kind of grew up in the 60s, you know, and the, the Beatles go out to, you know, India, and they kind of get in with that guy, uh, the Maharaji, or whatever his name was, and, and you know, in like the whole transcendental meditation, uh, the idea of sitting cross-legged on the floor, you know, it was so popular that after a while, it seemed like everybody and their dog was into it, and, uh, you know, See? <laughs> <laughs> well, it's a humor right there. Everybody and their dog. So, I mean, usually, when, when you think about meditation, you, you do get some weird ideas come to mind. And uh, a, a lot of things that the world would kind of think about meditation is not what the Bible has in mind. In fact, uh, you might even be tempted to use a different word for meditation because of the connotations that people often have. But it's just such a, a biblical word, such a strong word. Okay, well, let's take some passages that have in mind about meditation. What are, what are some uh, verses, you know, some of you guys have been in the Word a long time and you're like, like you, like, what, what are some passages that come to mind? Bill Watson. Uh, Joshua 1A. Come on, Ooh. buddy. <laughs> Joshua 1A. Joshua 1A. I mean, isn't it, is that not the classic? Uh, we're going to look at that together in just a second, all right? Uh, any other verses come to mind? Psalm 1. Yeah, you read well. <laughs> That guy's axe is sharp. <laughs> okay, all right, so you, we've got a couple of verses that we're looking at, but there's others as well. You know, I think about Psalm 19. Uh, Lord, let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be pleasing in your sight, O Lord, my rock and my redeemer. Morning, Dan. So, uh, the, you know, there's a number of different things that we've talked about, uh, especially if we went, uh, and, and I want to be careful here not to get off script too much, but, you know, I tell you, the whole emphasis in like Romans chapter 8 about minding the things of the Spirit. Uh, um, even in Romans chapter 12, when it talks about renewing the mind, if you just did a search on the word mind, it's for now, uh, the verb to mind. You know, to, to us, we use that mostly as a noun, your mind. But it, in Scripture, it's a verb. We're minding something. We're thinking about something. It's not the word meditation, but it's, it's basically what he's talking about. Like what you fixate on, you know, what you really do. And so you, you can develop just even out of that whole idea, uh, this argument for meditation as something that you really develop, develop a habit around. So, uh, but let's look at Joshua 1 8 together. Okay, I think, I think we have a slide for it, but um, if not, just turn there. I mean, this is one of those verses that you kind of underline, you memorize. Uh, <coughs> I remember early in my Christian life, it was one of the first verses that I really learned well. Okay, the setting of Joshua, obviously, is like, man, Moses is all this man. And uh, if you can imagine trying to fall, you know, fill the sandals of, of uh, Moses, and, uh, but uh, he's, uh, you know, he's gone up to Mount Nebo, Moses, he's, the Lord's taken him, and basically the, the mantle has passed to Joshua, and now he has to lead the people of Israel finally into the promised land. Okay, so they're on the east side of the, uh, or the west side of the Jordan, uh, east side of the Jordan River. They're going to uh, move uh, in, uh, uh, through the jo uh, Jordan River into the promised land and face, jo face uh, Jericho. And uh, I'm glad that y'all have found it because I'm still, <laughs> I, I can hardly talk and drive. Or talk and look at four minutes. That is the gospel truth right there. <laughs> <laughs> Jericho. 
job is just advance the slides. <laughs> Let's just do some role definition. <laughs> okay, so I mean, God, God's basically going to help this this man. Like, well, you can do this thing. You, know? <laughs> you can do it. Uh, last night we had this great <laughs> we had this great time in our small group, and and uh, uh, this this one wife in our group was talking about. You some big challenges in her life, and she's trying to, to you know, she's working on a PhD, and she's all, you know, all this different stuff, and, and she was kind of getting overwhelmed in it. And she said, "I was really, I thought I was going to have was go and have a nervous breakdown." And my husband just took me by the shoulders, and he went, "You can do it!" <laughs> and she said, "Yeah." After that, everything changed. <laughs> I just thought that was so funny. <laughs> this is the kind of guy who put in his arms putting his hands on Joshua's shoulders and saying, you can do it. And so in, in one day, he's kind of giving them, like, here's the way you're, you're going to make this thing happen. Uh, he talks about the importance of the word of God. Uh, let me pick up with verse 7. Only be strong and very courageous. Man, if men today need anything, mm -hmm. is be strong and courageous. Only be strong and very courageous. Be careful to do according to all the law that Moses, my servant, commanded you. Do not turn from it to the right hand or to the left that you may have good success wherever you go. Then, here we go, this book of the law shall not depart from your mouth, but you shall meditate on it day and night, so that you may be careful to do according to all that is written in it. For then you will make your way prosperous, and then you will have good success. Now, good success here would be what, do you think? Not what prosperity theologians would tell you. Hey, you'll be successful, you know, you'll be healthy, wealthy, and wise. But what's success here for Joshua? What's his mission? Like, man, get the people across the Jordan, get them into the land. Like, that's, he's saying, look, success to what I've called you to do is going to be all about knowing the word of God and dwelling on it. So day and night is a figure of speech. It's a, it, uh, I think it's called merism. It, it's the idea basically to say that all the time. Day and night means that you are consistently, constantly dwelling on the word of God. Uh, that uh, any time your thoughts are free, you know, when you're not having to solve a problem with a design chip or something, <laughs> that your, your mind drifts to the Word of God. And, and the deal is this, is that the reason why he wants him to meditate is that God wants Joshua to know that, hey, this isn't just about what you do, it's how you do it. And listen, man, this is really important to us. That sometimes, you know, we know what to do, but God's Word also addresses how we do it. I mean, that's why we say we're sharpening the axe because it's not just getting the tree down. It's like how you get the tree down. You know, it, it, it kind of speaks to that as well. But he basically says to Joshua, you're, the success of your mission is really conditioned on you knowing God's word and really meditating on it so that its principles and precepts like, really find their way into your heart. Meditation is the most effective way to get basic Bible knowledge into your um, your op your operational program, if you will, it, it just really is. And so it, it, it's it's not just loading the software. It's actually you know learning how to pull it up uh, in, in the right kinds of applications. And so uh, I'm excited about talking about this. Well, let's look at one more. Okay, let's go to Psalms. You got to love Psalm one. Uh, those of you who are doing the reading plan that the Bible, that the church is providing for you, you guys getting that in your your inbox email? You, you guys still do email? People, you have email? Okay, so we're not doing Twitter. But anyway, so you're getting a plan. A lot of people are catching on to this thing. We actually started it in Psalm one. Uh, Glenn Hamilton, who put this thing together for us, thanks Glenn. Appreciate that. He wanted to start uh, with Psalm one nineteen. Which takes five days to read. Um, you ever read Psalm 19? 119 is incredible. I said, Glenn, hey, let's let's go to Psalm 1. <laughs> so we did Psalm 1, and uh, it's kind of an intro to the book of Psalms, but blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the wicked, nor stands in the way of sinners, nor sits in the seat of scoffers. Isn't it true that who you hang out with really impacts you? It just really does. Like we, we totally get that about our kids. And think it doesn't really apply to us. Man, I tell you, who you hang with, who you sit, stand, and walk with, man, it's a big impact. But his delight is in the law of the Lord. And on his law, he meditates day and night. 
And so it takes great delight in God's Word. And again, you get that figure six day and night. So in other words, this is a constant, consistent, uh, you know, that you're meditating on God's Word. And we're going to try to flesh out what, it, what does it look like to meditate. We look at the results of this. It is like a tree planted by streams of water that yields its fruit in its season and its leaf does not wither. And all that he does, he prospers. You know, if you've been around for a while, you, you, you've heard me talk about, you know, taking a couple of different pilgr pilgrimages each year to San Antonio. <coughs> Go see the Alamo. Uh, we do the river walk. And uh, you guys have been there. So you've seen these huge trees, you know, whose root system, I mean, it's just kind of just digs deep, you know, into the water. If you've been, you know, tubing down to the water, you'll be seeing these scenes where these huge trees just planted there by the rivers of water. And so in that metaphor, what does the water represent? Life? Christ? It's basically the word of God here. This is talking about meditating in the word. I mean, look at it again. Okay, he says, he's talking about man, the one who delights in the law. And in the law, he's meditating day and night. He is like a tree, so the tree is us, who's planted by streams of water that yields its fruit in its season, its leaf does not wither. All he does prospers. So in other words, I think the, the metaphor that he's developing here is that if you want abundant fruit, fruit of character, you know, leadership, and all this stuff, if you want abundant fruit, you have to have deep roots that go deep into this water here, which I think is representative of meditating in the Word of God. Now, you know, some of you have said life know that it's true that... <clears throat> <clears throat> Normally, water uh, is representing life. Uh, you know, the, Jesus with the woman at the well. You know, this water that you know not of. It's, but here, this, uh, this psalm is basically talking about the water is the word of God. And you want to be as close to it as you can, man. If you're a tree, and if you're trying to bear fruit, man, let me get some roots into this thing. So, uh, again, we see this importance of meditation. So what else can we say about it? All right, I'm going to try to uh, draw something which ought to scare you. Um, and based on, I want to illustrate some of what uh, James is talking about. You see in your notes there, uh, James 1.19. I actually want to start with verse 22. Uh, someone pull that up for me. James chapter 1. And I, I guess we have a slide of it too. James chapter 1, 22 through 25, I think. And this is that great passage of the guy who looks in the mirror, you know. And, uh, and uh, you know, you see your image, and then some leave, and they, they forget, and uh, others, you know, they change. Like, I'm just kind of guessing this morning, just kind of looking at the crowd with some of you, like, maybe looked in the mirror just, just so briefly. And perhaps <laughs> forgot what, what you saw. <laughs> President company included. Uh, but... <clears throat> Uh, so anyway, this is a great metaphor. Let's see if we can milk this thing a little bit. Okay, so um, you see the passage here. Be doers of the word. Okay, let's stop right there because application of the word, that, that's what this whole thing is about. Okay, so, you know, learning the Bible, uh, memorizing the Bible, getting the Bible into you, like that's, that's so important. But it's, again, the, the ultimate goal is that we're actually applying it. We're living it out. Okay, so... James is especially burdened with the idea of being doers. Okay, so this right here, this says doing. That's what we want to do. We want to be doing. Okay, specifically we want to be doing what the Bible is telling us to do. Okay, so we go on, be doers of the word and not hearers only. Okay, so we, can, we, all, we all know what it means to be hearers. Uh, uh, because that way you de deceive yourself. Or if anyone is a hearer, of the word and not a doer, he's like a man who looks intently at his natural face in a mirror. Okay, so there is this idea of looking. All right, and and what he's saying is that the, the looking that we do ought to lead to doing. That's kind of the, where, where he's going in this argument. And the looking, there's Two different words 
in this passage for looks. Now your, your, your English just says looks for both of them, but I'm gonna try to illustrate the difference between them. Like, there's two different words he's saying. All right, and so he says, you know, he's like a man who looks intently at his natural face. And so this first word for looking has the idea of just, you know, uh, observation, perceiving. It's probably the way we would normally take the word look when, when you look at something. You know, you, you're observing, you're, you're perceiving, and it has that idea in mind, uh, this word kind of no eto, for what it's worth. But then he says, but uh, uh, he goes on and says, for he looks at himself and goes away and at once forgets what he was like. So this looking, whatever it is, it doesn't lead to doing, it leads to forgetting. So, you know, you guys walk out on a Sunday morning and you say, oh man, out of sight, out of mind. You know, whatever you heard, and, uh, you know, all of us can be like that. You know, we can walk out of journeyman, we can walk out of whatever that we've been listening and taking in, that we can be looking, but it's so easy to forget. It's like, man, we've just kind of looked in the mirror and we've seen who we are and who God wants us to be. And, uh, but instead of acting on that, instead of actually letting that move us to doing, it oftentimes it goes to forgetting. Okay? So let's keep uh, reading. For he looks at himself, goes away, and once forgets what he was like. But the one who looks into the perfect law, this is a different <coughs> word, okay? Uh, can't remember what it is, per cupto. But it, it's, it's a different word, and it's interesting because it's, it's a word that basically means to, um, uh, to get down low, to look at something, to bend over, to stoop down, is what the word looks like. It was used of um, the disciples when they came to the tomb. And they heard, hey, that Jesus had been raised from the dead. And uh, remember, Peter and John are running, and John gets there first, and he, they, he, he stoops down low and they look in. It was used of uh, that great passage in 1 Peter where it says, talking about uh, Jesus and his role and how the angels for a long time have looked intently you know, waiting for this time to come about. If you look at that first John, it says they've been looking, it's the same word. It's the idea of seeing something but wanting to really take it in, to, to get a good look. And the idea of stoop, uh, stooping down to see. Uh, you, you guys may have had a similar experience, but I remember one day when I was in seminary and Kathy and I were out at this park with Jake and Ben, and, and I can't remember if Kaylee was born in that room, but you know, we're out of here, and uh, we're playing football and wrestling, just having a good time. And all of a sudden, Kathy says, my ring, my ring is missing. And I think I had gotten her some, some kind of ring for Christmas, and, and it was gone. I mean, we'd been all over this park wrestling and pulling and, you know, playing football. And so what did we do? Like, we're immediately on our hands and knees, right? Some of you have lost a contact lens. You've lost something you think, man, this is a needle in a haystack and you're down there and you are just kind of <laughs> crawling through the grass and trying to you know, block out the whole thing and just look intently blade by blade of grass. And, and, and not just at each blade, but kind of in between each blade where it's kind of settled down in there and you're doing that one inch at a time and you're just pouring over it. That's the idea of this word. And so meditation is not just taking a glance at scripture. It's not just kind of doing a, a broad read, which I think is a helpful thing to do as well, get a big picture of scripture. But this is really finding, just really drawing in. Uh, just to finish the story, we, we didn't find the ring. And so we were really discouraged. And so we, we gathered the family up and we put our arms around each other. We just said, Lord, you know, if it's possible, we'd love to be able to find this ring. We're just praying and I'm kind of leading in this prayer. And when I opened my eyes from the prayer, first thing I saw was that ring. Isn't that pretty cool? Anyway, that's kind of a big memory in our family. But uh, it's that idea of intent look, uh, look, looking is, is what we're talking about here. And so what happens after this, though? It says, but uh, the one who looks into the perfect law, the law of liberty, and perseveres. Okay, so he doesn't forget. This one perseveres. Okay, that's the opposite of forgetting. Okay, so I'm, I'm persevering in it. 
being a, a no hearer who forgets, but a doer who acts, he will be blessed in what he is doing. And so this little uh, contrast here that we see, it helps us grasp, uh, again, the importance of meditation and the difference between just kind of a quick look, a broad look that you forget, and one where you really look into it and it impacts your life, you persevere in. And by the way, let me just tell you, meditation and any discipline that you guys embrace, like your qu like quiet time, you know, devotional reading, uh, memorization, meditation, all of that is like this river that we, we talked about in Psalm 1. And what happens is that it doesn't like transform you overnight, gentlemen. It, it's, it's like those river stones that we give out to new members. You've seen us do that, right? And man, it's smooth, glassed over, because it is set at the bottom of this river for a long, long time. Like it wasn't always that smooth, right? But when you set that rough-edged rock and over the many, many years, the water just flows over it, it just consistently gets smoother and smoother and smoother. And that's why what's needed is this idea of perseverance. This idea of remaining under, this hupomeno for perseverance, it's the idea of that I'm going to remain, I'm going to stay put. You know, as a rock, as a, as a man, like, I am going to stay in the Word of God. And it is consistently, over time, going to smooth away the rough edges. That I will not always be this angry. I will not always be this impatient. I will not always be this on edge. I will not always be a bitter. I will not always be lazy. I will not always be reluctant to step out. I will not always be timid. I will not always, because God is changing. In the spirit of God, using the word of God and the people of God, that's the process by which we change. And so we've got to stay put in the word of God. This is this river. We dig deep roots in there and we persevere. We don't give up. We don't forget. So man, imagine a church. Imagine if just all the men in this room, like that just characterized our life. I mean, imagine the, the impact that that has on our families, on our community, on our church. Okay, um, let's move a little bit further down here. And uh, we see that meditation, here's a kind of a definition. Meditation is looking intently on God's revealed truth. You guys freezing out there? We keep it cold so you stay away. Are you cold? You all right? Meditation is looking intently on God's revealed truth. So you can definitely, we've already developed the idea of looking intently on God's revealed truth, but uh, let's look uh, more closely here. So we've got a number of slides that uh, help us understand this. So what, what do we mean by revealed truth? Obviously, the Bible is God's revealed truth. So scripture is part of revealed truth. Uh, we're looking at telling on God's revealed truth. So scripture, next, creation, uh, we're told, uh, reveals who God is. Uh, you know, the heavens declare the glory of God. The skies proclaim the work of his hand. Day after day, they pour forth speech. Night after night, they dissipate knowledge. Uh, so in other words, creation itself speaks about who God is. It's another way that he reveals truth. Okay, a third way is um, preaching, teaching. And so, uh, you know, we get all kinds of opportunities to hear people uh, teach the word of God Sunday morning, Wednesday, uh, small groups, uh, podcasts that you might listen to. I tell you, gentlemen, make sure that you take some time and get familiar with this uh, resource that the church is providing to everybody called, called Right Now Media. It's an incredible resource. Uh, just uh, make sure you get familiar with that, especially you guys raising young kids. Great things to do with your children. Uh, great programming there, but small group leaders, great assets, great training for ministry. I mean, it's an incredible resource. But, uh, so lots of opportunities for preaching and teaching. Also, uh, uh, worship can be uh, a time where we just review uh, the songs of God. Uh, a lot of times, uh, worship music reminds us of truth about God, so it's another way that you take in. Even, uh, even art can be that way, Christian art. Finally, books. Last thing would be books. Uh, you know, things that we're reading. All of that is to say that there are a lot of different ways. We can add to this list probably. All these ways are basically give us exposure to the to truth. But here's the idea. If you look at this statement underneath there, it says our issue is not exposure to the truth. 
The problem is absorbing the truth. And this is where you really start selling the benefits of meditation. Because he says again, our issue is not exposure. It's not like we don't have enough opportunities to take the word of God in. You know, I, I just, we just illustrated several of that. You can think of more. And so what, what is the difference then with meditations? Okay, this is the idea of looking intently. So now, uh, what, what do we mean by that? First of all, you'll see quality versus quantity. Okay? okay, guys, make sure you're following the transition here. So we've got this working definition. We've talked about ways to get, to get the Word of God in our lives, and we're never short about that. It's not exposure that's the problem. It's absorbing it. And so with meditation, that's this looking intently that we've been talking about. The first thing to note from an observation point of view is you're talking about quality versus quantity. So uh, right now, you know, I'm doing the uh, devotional reading plan like a lot of you guys with the church. And so we're taking a chapter of Genesis a day, right? Like there's a lot of stuff in there. So, you know, you read through a whole chapter and something jumps out at you and, you, you know, you kind of do whatever you do with your quiet time. That's, that's kind of, you know, the broad look. But with meditation, it's where you take something... Uh, probably a lot smaller than that, and you're really digging in and with, with, with more of what we mean quality, that, that you're going to focus in there and really kind of get hold of one truth and just kind of chew on that thing. You're just going to chew on it. Another way of making the same point is I would say with reading, you're looking at the whole forest. With meditation, you're looking at a tree. Describing, okay, what kind of bark is this? You know, what's the height of this tree? You know, what's the fruit this tree, on, on this tree? What kind of shade does it throw on the ground? I mean, there's all kinds of detail that you can start looking at. And you just make yourself start looking at this thing and making observations on it. That's meditation. Uh, so one is broad, one, one is narrow. That's all that has to do with this quality versus quantity. Uh, one is slow and one is fast. Um, anyway, all that deals with that first one. The second thing is scripture memory. Now, one of the great things that helps us with meditation is if you memorize a passage. And so, like in our uh, holy habits that we're putting in front of the church, you know, we have one for meditation, one for for memory. But oftentimes, those two things really come together. They don't have to be. In other words, I can take something I'm reading in scripture, take a verse, take a truth, and just study, look at it, and just you know, I'm meditating on that. The beauty about having something that God had really caught your attention with, because it either speaks to a need in your life, or it speaks to um, uh, some, uh, you know, emotionally how you're feeling about something, for whatever reason, that when you memorize that, you now own it. And you can bring it up and meditate on it at any time. So how, how many of you guys have heard the whole cow and its cud? Analogy for meditation, right? I mean, you guys are mainly young. I mean, agricultural <laughs> accountants. You got to you know this stuff. Okay, so like, I'm not a farmer, never claim to be a farmer, but I've heard you know, cows and other animals like them. You know, have this idea. We've got a veterinarian who can give us more detail. But. And so, you know, they digest something and then they pull it up anytime they want and kind of say, well, that tasted pretty good. And that alfalfa that I swallowed, that was pretty good. Let me pull it up and get some more out of it. And they just kind of bring it up. And, like, that's really a pretty good picture. <laughs> that when you have a passage memorized, I mean, you can pull it up at any time and just go over it and just chew on it. And then, you know, you move away from it, you swallow it, bring it back up later. I, I, this has been so helpful to me. I, I, I have not always been consistent in this discipline, but oftentimes it's been part of kind of my repertoire, if you will, just in terms of staying closely connected. And so I have passages that I've memorized that are really meaningful to me. Uh, some of them put into words how I feel oftentimes. Um, some of these passages deal with areas of weakness that I need to f straight form up in. And man, when, when I lay down at night, I'm usually either thinking about something I, I just read. Right now, I'm kind of reading this little American Revolution thing. <laughs> or I'm reading, I, I, I'll pull up a passage of scripture, and I'm chewing on it. And it is just so helpful. 
And the thing is this, gentlemen, is that the more you chew on something, the more you get out of it. And, and, and just the process bears fruit. It's, it's a way of staying in the water, the river. Uh, I used to go uh, with some friends to, uh, gosh, what was the name of that park out west? Uh, Big Ben. Watson, where, where did we used to go with the Lumpkins? Up the river, out there the, where they camp every summer. What's the name of that, John? Garner, Garner, Garner State Garner, Park. Garner State Park. The Frio River. Yeah, the Frio River there. And, uh, you know, <laughs> you, you, you find a place over the river where, you know, it's cool, fresh water. And they've got these big boulders in there. And, and what we used to do is we'd find a place just to sit down up against one of those rocks. And the water just rushes over you. And you're real comfortable. I mean, you can just sit there all day long. It's the idea of just camping out in the Word of God. This is what meditation is. You, you are just camping out and letting the water of God's Word just rush over you. It's refreshing, cool. Uh, meditation, when you, when you can at any time, driving, standing in line, pull up something that you're chewing on. And you just benefit from that. Um, so, you know, I, I guess... I wanted to say at this point that and try to make flesh this out a bit. Like I just tell you, one, one passage has meant so much to me because I think it deals so much with leading. Uh, as men, as leaders in the church, is Psalm 61, where I think David is completely overwhelmed with his responsibility of leading the nation of Israel. And he, he starts out, he says, Hear my cry, O God, listen to my prayer. And I can tell you times when I have felt overwhelmed and my, my heart just goes there. I, and I just start quoting this verse. And, and, and I say that, and he says, uh, you know, listen to my prayer. Lead me to a rock that is higher than I. Oh, man, I love that imagery. I mean, David probably has in his mind what we know now as Masada, when he talks about a strong mountain. He says, lead me to a rock that's higher than I got. Basically, he says, everybody is leaning on me. Like everybody in my life, they look to me as their rock. My wife, my kids, church life, they're looking at me to like lead, and I feel the pressure of all this. He says, I need a rock higher than I. Man, I just love that. He says, for you have been my refuge, my strong tower against the foe. I long to dwell in your tent forever and seek refuge under the shelter of your wings. And I can tell you, just after meditating and meditating on that, God just starts showing me stuff. Like the whole progression of imagery there. From a high rock to a, a strong tower inside his tent and under his wings. You see the progression of that? in the intimacy, like the way we stand up under the pressure of being men who lead, is we just really seek out intimacy with God. And there have been times when I say, you know, guys, you know, the Lord, have I, have I done all I can here. Like, is it is it time for me to walk? I, at times when that question comes to mind, and I started thinking, man, I don't know, can I, can I still pastor these young bucks, you know? Yeah, I love that passage where I think David starts quoting a promise that God gave him. It was what we call the Davidic covenant. And he says, he turns to first person, he turns to third person, he says, increase the days of the king's life his years for many generations. May he be enthroned in your presence forever. Appoint your love and faithfulness to protect him. Then I will pay my vows day after day and fulfill my sacrifice. In other words, David basically says, when I think I can no longer leave, I remember what God promised me. And he basically just quotes 
several words and, and phrases coming out of the Davidic covenant. Like all of that was immensely just incredible in my life. That psalm, that, that psalm has been so much part of my life for 20 years. And just chewing on it, and I mean, I, I'm not saying like I could just go on from passage after passage after passage, you know, forever and ever and ever, but I've got a number of passages that mean that much to me. That I just regularly pull up in, in, in my mouth and chew on it. It is my cut. <laughs> and God wants you to have those as well. And when you pull something into your heart, something that really speaks to who you are, something that captures how you feel, something that speaks to an area of need or weakness, you want to own that. You want that to be so much part of your thinking. It just takes over the way you think. And then whenever you find yourself in a similar circumstance, that immediately pops up into your head. That's what we want. That's what meditation gives you uh, in this whole process. Okay, the last thing is, uh, he says, or it's not the last thing, but uh, the next one is discussion. And so a, a great way to meditate is just to have discussions. And so I've got a group of guys I'm doing some discipleship stuff with. And man, I just love the discussions that we have in there around the Word of God. And so we're trying to take a verse apart, you know, and you're, you know, the, you're, you're making all these observations about this verse, and everybody's coming and sharing this stuff. And discussion is a great, great way to further uh, uh, meditation. Next is contemplate. Contemplate. This is just the idea, man, I'm just thinking. I'm just, I'm, I'm really giving a lot of time just thinking about this verse. And so for me, you know, a lot of that is a result of Q&A. It's just throwing a lot of questions at the verse. It's, it's like, okay, what, why is this verse getting my attention? Why, why does this, you know, out of this entire chapter, why does this verse capture my mind? You know, what are some of the implications of this verse? Uh, why is it so important? Why is it so relevant? What would, what would life be like if this wasn't true of God? I mean, there's a number of different questions that you just start kind of beating the thing with. You know, you're just trying to beat out of this verse everything that it's got. You're, you're, you're just thinking and dwelling on it, contemplation. Uh, let me show you this cartoon. You guys remember uh, ever look, looking at Sunday comics? And you remember you have the whole idea of two things that you know, look the same, and okay, immediately you're looking for the differences right now. Okay, how many, how many of you see six things? 1,001, 1,002, 1,003, 1, come on man, come on, come on, come on, come on. Okay, you see them, don't you? See these differences? Okay, you, you see the, this little deal, this deal, right? You saw that. Okay, and then look at this, this little sock. Oh look, there's a difference there. Flower, uh -huh. Uh, flowers. Who said the flowers? Is there a difference in the flowers? Yes, there is. I didn't see that one. The little, the little waves turning around. The sun is different. Like so there's, there's all kind of things. Now this one isn't really a very good one because it's pretty obvious. I think this was for like maybe third graders. <laughs> but you've seen these things like some of them are harder. Like, but and you just think, man, I'm just going to look at this deal and you know, okay. And you're just not going to see this stuff. For the ones that are really good, I mean, you have to really spend some time over it. And then when you see it, all of a sudden it's just like, man, how did I ever miss that? It's so obvious. But it wasn't obvious, was it? Meditation is like this. It's like, man, I'm going to look at this passage, and I, you know, I have kind of a, a, my immediate cursory look at it. There's some things that jump out at you. But if you will discipline yourself, that's what meditation is, is a discipline. That I am going to chew on this thing, and I'm just going to believe. I'm just going to go in with the expectation that there is a lot more here than what I initially see. And so with that expectation, and I would say that's always going to be a true assumption to make. And it's not like you have to start spiritualizing stuff. You don't have to go weird on it. You just start looking at it, and there is a lot here. I mean, I showed you on Psalm 61 a long time before I was just blown over by the progression of that. 
contingency, right? That you, you, you just look and you look. This is what I mean by contemplate. The man you're just pouring over, pouring over this stuff. Okay, we need to wind down here pretty quick. Um, the last deal they have here is Philippians 4 8, which is a method. It's, it, it's a method uh, by which to meditate. If you look at the second page after the discussion, small group questions. See a footnote down here where he basically takes that uh, Philippians 4 8 about whatever is honorable, whatever is excellent, you know, meditate on these things, think about these things. And he uh, builds a set of questions around each one of those words that you could use to, while you're meditating. You know, you're, you're trying to beat this, this verse, beat everything out of this verse that you can. And, and, and the way that you beat it is you just throw questions at it. And uh, he's suggesting you know, these questions as one method uh, to meditate. Okay, let me uh, stop for a second and just open it up uh, for one second and say, you guys who have embraced this discipline of, of meditation, uh, any words of wisdom that you want to throw out to anybody from your experience of meditation? Anything that you think would be helpful for the rest of men to hear? Yeah. yeah. Don't get in a hurry about it. Don't get in a hurry. Yeah. It's sometimes, to your point, when I've found myself really getting the best out of what I'm meditating on, it's because I'm. sometimes it takes weeks just to get through the first three or four words. And yeah. in situations... God has a funny way of bringing to life to you and, and stuff like that. So I just say, don't get in a hurry. Nuggets are, are precious. So. That is really, really good. Uh, because it is true, when you're doing meditation, it's not like you have a different thing to meditate on each day. A lot of times, it's something that you're going to invest a couple of weeks, a month, maybe even longer, just chilling on, coming back to. Uh, I know for the passages that I've been telling you about in my life, that's the way it's been. Days and days and days. And then coming back later, days and days and days. But, you know, really a good good point. Something else. Yeah. Uh, journaling about what you read can really help. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. When you're meditating and you start seeing stuff, start collecting observations that you're making, is that's a, that's a great technique. That's good. Find passages that are relevant to what you're going through. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Psalm 56, 11. Uh, God, I put my trust. I will not be afraid. What can man do? Yeah. So I, I, I'm guessing that there was a time in your life where that, that was such life-giving. Yeah. A lot of, <clears throat> a lot of unexpected phone calls not knowing exactly what the outcome is going to be. Oh man. I mean, so much of this is born out of where you are in life at any moment. And you come across a passage like that that you know it just feels like God is saying this is a special gift of truth I'm giving you. That you probably have read through a million times. But you're in a situation where this is like, it, it's just like, and the Lord himself just said, Danny, this is for you. Amen. Meditating on those passages is really good. So I, I'm pretty, I'm, I'm a lot bigger on that kind of stuff. Um, the things that I've memorized and really meditated on has been more of that. I mean, uh, a lot of men would say, and I agree with this, I've done some of this, you know, about just, you know, key doctrinal issues that reveal things about God that you can chew on. You know, like, a, for instance, you know, one passage that's really foundational for us this year is John 15. Back, that's the passage I'm preaching on Sunday. Really, really a great passage. The importance of us abiding in Christ, where his branches in the vine. Yeah, that's a passage I've memorized, I chew on. So anyway, that was a great, great input. Last thing I'll leave with you is uh, some of you guys have remember studying in English Lit. Uh, you may have read Nathaniel Hawthorne's short story called The Great Stone Face. Uh, have you ever heard that? It's huge. It's a, uh, here's, here's kind of a cover to it, but it's basically a short story that tells about this small village that's kind of nestled in this little valley uh, surrounded by these mountainous peaks. And one particular uh, 
mountainous peak. Uh, the, the wind over the years had just kind of carved uh, the features of this uh, uh, man with all the strength and character you know, that could be embodied in just the appearance you know, of, a, of a figure. And uh, it was called by the village the Great Show Face. And in fact, over the years, for as early as anyone could remember, there was this legend that kind of sprung up in the valley that one day that the village would be visited by this incredible leader who would match the features of the Great Stone Face. And, uh, you know, over the years, they kind of lived with this expectation. It was kind of like the Jews looking for the Messiah to come. But in this, this village, it was, it, it was that sense of this great, great leader. Now, there was a young man who heard the uh, uh, legend when he was a young man, a little boy named Ernest. And he, over the years, grew up. And he was fascinated uh, with the great stoke face. In fact, uh, whenever he uh, had time between chores or school, he would go out into this field and he would just kind of sit down and, was a gaze up at the great stone face. And that kind of became his habit uh, through, through life. Now, over the course of time, as he kind of moved his way into adolescence and beyond, the village was visited by a number of different, really uh, uh, strong leaders. In fact, uh, the first one was a, uh, a, a conquering general. And he made a big splash when he came into town, came into this village, and people wondered if this was, was really the great stone face. And, and uh, without going into a lot of detail, uh, things happened that uh, basically uh, revealed that this guy didn't have the character that matches these features. It wasn't the conquering hero. Uh, another one that came through was a, a successful merchant, you know, someone with real wealth, who's made his way into the world and he brought kind of this international, global, successful uh, kind of image, and, you know, which attracts people. We kind of start following success like that. And people thought maybe this is the great stone face, but uh, he himself as well disappointed uh, people. The third one, as Ernest continued to grow, and uh, uh, third one was a, 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 a writer. He was a, like a poet who could, uh, uh, you know, find words that inspired people. And so, you know, he was a good orator. And so people thought, man, maybe, maybe this is it, the great, great stone face. And, and again, each of these guys had certain defects that disqualified them in the eyes of the village. Uh, nevertheless, uh, Ernest just continued, as was his habit, often to go out into the field, and he would just gaze up at the great stone face, just looking and just pondering all that was uh, represented in these strong features of this face. And on one particular evening, as was his custom, uh, people had come out to kind of gather around him, and he had, had kind of uh, you know, grown into this kind of layman idea of just kind of speaking, encouraging people. And it was one particular evening when uh, the last person, the poet, the, the writer who had come to recognize that he was in the gravestone face and the village recognized he was, he's out there and he's watching uh, Ernest talk. And at one particular moment, Ernest pauses and he kind of looks up and the poet looks past Ernest and sees the great stone face, and he says, Hey, Ernest himself is the great stone face. And the whole village immediately embraced him as a fulfillment of the legend. In the days and the time that he spent just meditating, looking intently, at the gray stone face, transformed him into his likeness. And the Bible says that's what happens when we look into the Word of God. That the great stone, the high rock, our refuge, he transforms us. Father, we pray that you would just take this Word and just impress it deeply into our hearts. I pray you give us a sense of excitement as we think about, Lord, what would this look like in my life if I started carving some time out to just dwell and, and chew and chew and chew on, on certain passages? And then, God, that you would um, just start bearing the incredible fruit. Uh, Lord, we just want to say to you today that as men, we long to dig deep roots into you, to go deep into the river of your word and to med meditate upon it day and night. And we ask that you would build a culture and community here in this room of men just cheering each other on in these very things. 
And we pray for this in Jesus' name. Amen.